<laughs> I saw I saw Dr. Bear and I'd never paid attention to the heart. Isn't God, it cute? Gene is a goddamn nut. So cute. So uh, so we're going against <laughs> Um, in typical TIR fashion, we're going against the State of the Union address mm-hmm. and all these other shows that are going to be centered on the State of the Union address. And we are not going to talk about the State of the Union. No. Oof. They have the they have the Brandon. We have the bear. <laughs> <laughs> and and double on and <laughs> oh evening everyone i'm your host jason miles and welcome to another episode of this is revolution podcast thank you all for joining us before we start if you're new to the channel please subscribe and don't forget to hit that notification bell so you are alerted whenever we go live we're constantly adding cross streams with other channels and adding new shows speaking of shows we have another episode of a new show with our very own gene bajlan and his co-host c Derek varn uh they'll have mostly more historic conversations opposed to the gaming materialist show that they do with discourse miniatures the show is called nailing it down and tomorrow they'll be doing a show on the recent deadly earthquakes in turkey and syria failures of the state to retrofit buildings that show will go live at our normal 6 p.m pacific time also if you haven't checked it out our very own mt tucson has a piece out in Sublation Magazine. We even, de- we even did a show about it, questioning Black History Month in its current iteration and how we should possibly reimagine it. And I also have a new piece that dropped Friday called Is the Contemporary Left a Branding Exercise in Sublation? So wherever you are listening to this show and watching it, there should be links in the description. And producer extraordinaire mt toussaint will also be putting links to both of those pieces and the show we did on her show in the chat also there should be links to even more things that the tir universe writes uh gene bajlan wrote something not too long ago was it for financial times or foreign affairs i can't remember he writes so much mm-hmm um pascal robert was working on something last i heard i don't know if it's published yet so we are busy beavers over here in the tir universe not just pumping out these shows but also writing that said if you enjoy what we do here at tir and don't want to make the yearly or monthly commitment show your support with revolutionary merch you know i think the faceless voice of reason the mass precarious producer mt toussaint please welcome actually mt toussaint thank you hello hello very nice MT. to be here uh, hey without hey. you we wouldn't be here doing this show right no not this one <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, briefly before we bring in uh, our guest and you know my co-host, my home dog, can you tell the people a little bit about the merch and what they get if they do decide to become patrons? Go. The merch is amazing. We got hoodies <gasps> in different colors. <laughs> I mean, oh. I think that's kind of a big deal. Colorways. Yes. We got the wheat and the black. Matches your Tim's. Perfect for hopping over a turnstile. We see you. <laughs> <laughs> we got snap back, snapping back. Like oh. all those uh, alligators, Pascal Rassels in Miami. That uh, I think snap, people snap, don't snap. understand that that's what Pascal does when he's not a TIR. He's a... Uh, Mm-hmm. He's he because of the show he wrestles less alligators. Mm-hmm. But he is an alligator wrestler. This is true. Let people, know, let people know the truth. It's like his thing. Yeah, not writing or anything. <laughs> not getting all <laughs> these articles out, but alligator nope. wrestling. Oof. Alligator wrestling. Oof. Yes, we have mugs, we have T-shirts, and if you become a patron, you can talk to Pascal. About alligator wrestling. Oh, thank you for reminding the listening audience that they can talk to any member of the TIR crew. Um, and Pascal was asking me the other day, he's like, there's no one that wants to talk. I can't wait to talk to people. Yeah. He's he's backed off of social media so he can have more time to talk to patrons about alligator wrestling mm-hmm. and uh, dressing like a Haitian dictator on air. <laughs> Speaking of the Duvalier regime, please welcome my homie, my dog, the man of the Mau Mau Hour, who I had to make a clip of that show. It was so good. Please welcome the Pascal Robert. Peace and greetings from the audience. Peace and greetings to the chat. Peace and greetings, Jason Miles. Peace and greetings, M2 Sun. I do not wrestle alligators, but I would like to go hunting for alligator because I think alligator meat would be very tasty. Eh, eh, eh. Mm. I had alligator enough when I lived and worked in Louisiana. No. Eh. I just can't with you two. I just, I, I just have a feeling it would be pretty tasty. You know, it's like fishy chicken. Oh, I, I can see that. And the, and it's just there's something about it that just, oh, I just I, I, and I'm okay with like different things to eat. Somebody hands you, you know, when you travel, I don't, you know, you can't really be a douche and be like, oh, sorry, I don't eat fucking alligator when that's all they got, right? So you, you, you can. But you, alligator I, good, I, raccoon bad. <laughs> we're traveling. Look, if we're traveling, and all our host has is raccoon, we just eat the raccoon. Nah, man. Mm, mm. Nah, man. You guys are trail. that rude. You guys are some rude guests. I got some trail mix in my bag. You can have some. Look, that trail That's mix. Not rude. Stuff. It's not going to last forever. You're going to eat the trail mix on the long drives. <laughs> By the time you get down, all they got is like Vienna sausages and alligator meat. It's just what you're going to have. It's just Vienna sausage have. versus alligator meat. <laughs> Whoa. Would you just spontaneously combust on the spot? Like asking me to choose between two of my children. Alligator <laughs> meat and <laughs> Vienna <laughs> sauce. She's a vegan, man. You know, she she cries about eating cheese. It doesn't work. It doesn't oh. work. <laughs> Vegetarian, and I should so cry eat, more about eating cheese. You you'll you'll eat the cheese. I'll eat the cheese. Sometimes. But you were a vegan at one point, and you were all afraid of cheese. Look, here's the thing. I'm afraid. <laughs> so, so who's afraid of the big bad cheese? Big bad cheese. You're afraid of big cheese. <laughs> You big big Wisconsin. <laughs> Look, just if you can eat the cheese, you can eat Vienna sausages and alligator uh, etouffee. Pause. Is that you? <laughs> what? Vienna sausages, pause. 
<laughs> mm. They just taste so gross. Vienna sausages? <laughs> I've never liked yes. Vienna sausages. Those are They're so not bad. good. Straw Macau says grits with Velveeta. Oh my God. That would be one of those things where Velveeta I would have Velveeta cheese? Oh, Velveeta be... cheese isn't even cheese. It's like the plastic of cheese. That would yeah. be one of those things where like I would be like, oh. <laughs> if, <laughs> Gotta go. Tucson, if, if it makes you feel any better, like uh, if I was at a vegan's house and all they had was like almond milk, I'd have to be like, oh, I'll just have the coffee black. You don't like almond milk? Oh, almond milk is delicious. Nut milks oh. just don't. I don't like nut milk. You don't like nut in your milk? Good to know. That too. <laughs> that too. That Happy too. Valentine's Day, guys. For Happy you State too. of the Union. Oof. Yeah. It's good like that it. no one's watching tonight, so we can get those things by before we get next. <laughs> I'm gonna milk this. It's delicious. Uh, it is. Kushla, it is. Driggle, dri driggle. I'm over now. We're to keep talking about nut milks. Drizzle that bacon grease on hot biscuits, ermagird, with butter and jam. Yes. So Tucson, if I made you a biscuit and it had mm -hmm. bacon grease on it, would you eat it? No. <sighs> That's totally unnecessary. Bacon grease. But you didn't the know it had bacon grease on it. I would know once I tasted it. You meat eaters are always trying to give me meat. And so Pause. I I know what meat tastes like. <laughs> I'm so mad. We can't even <laughs> read the comment. <laughs> we can't read. <laughs> Does Jason's friend like nut milk? Good question. No. Well, is soy nuts? <laughs> <laughs> we do have a doctor. Perhaps he knows. <laughs> oh, 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 man. Let's, let's just ask Dr. Asatar Bear medical questions all night. <laughs> but then show him, like, hey, my nuts feel funny. What is. <laughs> <laughs> This is just what he went to school for. <laughs> all those years, all that hard work for tonight. It was for tonight. Oh, man, I've been off this Boy, is a bean. This long. These assholes bring me back. <laughs> <laughs> he knows his whole vegan game is gone. Like he's just he can't even go to Whole Foods no more. <laughs> nah, is Dasatara you know. vegan? No. No, 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 no. We've he had said no, like he said no, like he eats elk. He's like, he, he, I know, right? He said no, like he goes to Popeyes every week. Like, <laughs> like Twenty-four beats, eating caribou and bison, <laughs> and ice cream. <laughs> She's bad. <laughs> Really, really not a vegan. <laughs> oh, caribou. <laughs> Dylan Baxter says, you guys are really missing out on the State of Union. His stress is so good. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go out on a limb and Biden say I'm breathing? not missing out on that senile man having a State of the Union address. I'm about to say, is Biden still breathing? <laughs> Biden's State of the Union address is like when I'm reading the script and I miss a line. <laughs> <laughs> And then with the, the price of cheese, Jack and black people and homeless. Yeah. <laughs> they, they just start Basically. clapping and looking clap, around. Clap, 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 clap. <laughs> Do we stand up now? Do we stand up what? for this one? <laughs> what the fuck did he just say? <laughs> what if they just gave uh, Joe Biden the script to Red Dawn and he thought that was the state of the universe? <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's I mean, why. is it not the script you read, Don? <laughs> <laughs> That's why none of us work in electoral politics, because one of us would do something stupid like that. I mean, yeah. Yeah, Pascal, on the other hand, he's he's a classy dictator. <laughs> he's who the people really want to hear from about this thing. Only should have been kneecaps. 
<laughs> That's what you would do. The, how long is Pascal's interview going to be for that position? <laughs> nice. Pascal's a secret service person. Oh, no, nah, man. <laughs> mm-mm, mm-mm. I dig the suits and the little ear thing, but mm-mm. Mm-mm. But uh, today we're going to be talking about marks and love. Yes. I found an Ingalls quote. If the reign of the wife over the husband as inevitably inevitably brought out by the factory system is inhuman, the former rule of the husband over the wife must have been inhuman too. It's from the condition of the working class in England by Ingalls in 1845. Today we'll be talking to a friend of the show and a friend in real life. Dr. Asatar Bear on Marx, Ingalls, and what's love got to do with it all? Please welcome Dr. Asatar Bear. Hey everyone, thanks so much for having me back on this is revolution. Always enjoy being here. <laughs> Dr. Asatar Bear. So good to see you. <laughs> Uh, oh, you guys did add your questions. So, Dr. Bear, glad to have you back on the show. It's been a while. Let's it's been too long. It has. And you haven't came to visit. <laughs> <laughs> if I knew that was all it would t- it, that it took, then I would visit all the time. You know. <laughs> well, I'm coming up actually on Valentine's Day. I'll be in, uh, I'll be in Irvine on Valentine's Day. I'll be speaking. Oh, nice. At uh, at UC Irvine. Fantastic. And they're paying me to make uh, these dick jokes. But seriously. (laughs) (laughs) Jesus. (laughs) I responded when I was asked, I was like, have you seen the show? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, This is what we were, we were actually arguing about this off air. And we just want to get get right down to it. Was Marx a shit husband? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah, I mean, in some ways, perhaps, yeah. I mean, I think um, that the family lived under a lot of strain, right? I mean, like, I, you know, strain that many of us are familiar with today, but some some parts of it are are like extra due to the time, right? I mean, like. You know, Marx had uh, two of his children uh, died, you know, um, just because they're, you know, poor and lacked access to health care and, and so on. Right. I mean, that's uh, that's pretty intense. So, you know, they're um, and, you know, they're refugees. Right. They're 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 living poor. Um, and um, I mean, you know, not to like make excuses or whatever. Right. Like, you know, Marx had an affair and things like this. Right. So. Um, I don't know. You know, I, I, I'm I'm not that kind. Of, I, I'm gonna have to just come clean and say I'm not that type of like Marx scholar. You know, like I'm not I'm not mm-hmm. the best on all the details of Marx's life, right? You're not, a, you're not a Marx drama scholar, is what you're saying? Not really. No, you know, like I'm I'm more I, I you know I'm I'm an economic theorist, right? So that's that's more what I focus on. But you know, you can't avoid uh, picking up a thing or two. Uh, you know, just being in the being in the business. You know, over the years. Mm-hmm. Uh, Go ahead, Dr. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask you a question that's more relevant to Marx's actual theorization relative to the institution of marriage. Many people on the right, one of the term, ways they use to try to discredit Marx is that he talks about the oppressive nature of the traditional marriage, bourgeois marriage infrastructure. But can you explain how Marx's ideas about the nature of relationships under capitalism demonstrate how the extraction of labor, of wealth and labor from the proletariat while workers make the traditional bourgeois marriage structure not possible for them to aspire to? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, um, Ingalls is known more for his writings on the family, right? So, um, but you know, Marx, Marx definitely, I think, you know, he knew about all this stuff, right? Supportive of it, and so on. And you know, I think the basic thrust of the of the idea here is that, you know, marriage is more or less a property arrangement, right? And 
you know, that that this property arrangement, it's of a piece with the entire way that property functions in society, right? That private property is a right that the bourgeoisie have. It doesn't, you know, they, they like to spin it as, oh, this is a universal right that everyone needs, right? Private property is what allows the wealthy to exclude wealth from those who created it, right? I mean, and this is why it says in the Communist Manifesto, what is, you know, what what is what do we want in a nutshell? Abolition of private property, right? We we want the wealth that is socially produced to be used for the benefit of everyone in society, right? So I, I feel like I'm getting a little bit out of the <laughs> line of the question, but so are you trying to say that Marx is all about polyamory? <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want to make sure. We were always I want to make sure because <laughs> maybe I'm not a good socialist because I don't know if I want my baby's mom just out in the street like that. Yeah, <laughs> she's for the streets. <laughs> she's for it. <laughs> it's really interesting. You know, there's this part, uh, you know, where they talk about like, the criticisms of the of the of the family or of the, the marriage as a property structure. And then they say, well, we, now we get criticized because then it's like, well, are, are women to become community property They, I mean, that's like basically their language for, for polyamory, right? Like in the, in the communist manifesto and, and, it, and, and they're like, y'all are really not getting it. Right. Women are property, right. It's not, you know, <laughs> that's what we're saying here. You know, like, <laughs> Tucson, do you have something you'd like to add to the women of property? Um, no. <laughs> no, wasn't you, really you a question speak. in my mind. <laughs> you, you may now speak, woman. <laughs> well, okay. He he may have been a shit husband, so to speak. Um, and a cantankerous comrade. But what do you think that we can learn from those relationships today? Mm. Well, I, I think, you know, if I could just return before uh, we move on to the earlier question, which is like, um, what are the strains on like this traditional notion of marriage, right? Like, like the right loves to talk about this, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, there's all these strains on the traditional marriage structure and whatever. And, you know, how does capitalism produce those strains? You know, like, like the fact that everyone has to work so hard just to make rent, right? Like just to have enough to kind of get by, right? I mean, like what kind of toll does that impose on all of our relationships, right? Like our marriages, our, you know, our relationship with our children, our parents, et cetera, right? Like every relationship in our life is affected by, you know, the economics, right? I mean, and it's not economic determinism. It's like everything is connected organically, right? But like, it's a factor, you know? We have less stress in our lives. We have more time to, to be with each other, uh, you know, if we didn't have so many economic concerns, right? If we, if we weren't part of this constant extraction of our surplus, like, of course, right? So is the argument you're making is that capitalism in its contemporary form creates the economic precarity that leads to the fracture of the traditional uh, intimate marital structure or any kind of marital or family structure because it requires all of time be rendered to produce surplus, sur surplus revenue for the lords of capital? Yeah, I mean, that's a, um, I think so. Um, I think that, you know, capitalism um, attacks certain traditional structures, right? And and upholds certain ones. You know, I mean, and it's, it's like, there's a lot that has been, there's a lot of traditional aspects of life that have been just sort of uprooted and, and, and changed, right? Like by, by capitalism. And it's interesting that, that marriage you know, this, this very feudal institution, right? Like when we look at, at marriage as it's conceived, you know, in the United States or, you know, I think the United States is even more, has this even more than Europe does at this point, right? Um, the Europeans are sort of over it, you know? But like it, America, we have such romance about it, right? Like 
what marriage is and could be. I mean, it's it's incredibly idealistic, right? I mean, um, and I mean that both in the sense of very romantic and also in the, the Marxist sense, right? That we're taking this grand idea and making that in the forefront, right? Like if we if we hold fast to this idea, then it makes you know everything else irrelevant, right? Like, and of course it doesn't, right? I mean, um, so I, I just think that's sort of that that's sort of interesting how you know there's a I mean there's a whole industry behind this, right? The, the marriage industry, right? Multi billion dollar industry that exists to you know sell us this kind of vision of like the perfect wedding, you know, and <laughs> right. And by extension, the the perfect marriage. So, I mean, you know, capitalism seizes on traditions when it can make money from those traditions, right? <laughs> Look, man, I can't speak for you, but me and my second wife had the perfect wedding. So, uh, well, I'm thinking like the tradition of having a very expensive diamond um, as your engagement ring. Oh, dude, the engagement ring was fat too. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for letting us know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, look, neither one of them are here with me now. So there was this study that showed that, like, the more you spend on the wedding, uh, you know, like, the lower your chances of of making it five years are. Like, we know, spent zero on the wedding. We got married on tour in in the forest in England. Sounds nice. Wow. See? Right? Then that sound cool. It does. Yeah. Enchanted forest. <laughs> well, Dr. Barry, you said something that I really found fascinating. You were talking about how in America we have a romanticized notion of marriage that we cling to in terms of this kind of uh, Ozzy and Harriet kind of 2.5 kids, white picket fence, house in the suburbs. One of the things that I've always found fascinating about this notion that we have uh, that is very much perpetuated by conservatives about the traditional family, the traditional family, how the period of time in which that they hearken back to as the model period for the traditional family is the 50s. What is oftentimes neglected by these conservatives who go back to the 50s is that the lifestyle that allowed working class people to have a traditional family in the 50s was completely the product of the expansion of the welfare state as a result of Keynesian economic development after World War II and the New Deal, that it was the closest thing we actually had to state-sponsored uh, social infrastructure and economic total management was really between 1940, 1939, 19, 20, 19, early 1930s, up until the 70s, that allowed this stable kind of two-family system. And what's really fascinating is if you look at the history of family and marriage in America, before the New Deal and before that, in the, going back to the 19th century and the early 20th century, the extended family, particularly in the agrarian society, was much more normal. You had 10, 15 different people living in a house, and the notion of just a husband and a wife and the normal kind of family was not the norm at all. But what we find is that this period of time that conservatives always clamor about was rooted in the expansion of the welfare state. Why is that something that very few people are able to really highlight? Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, you know, I, and I, I think that that circles back to, right, like what are all the, the economic factors that affect our relationships, right? Um, and and I would just highlight one aspect of that too, since Keynesians love to be like, well, this is the golden age of capitalism. And this is the, this is the time of the you know, capital labor accords and all this stuff. Like, you know, one reason why that even ever existed is because of the threat of communism, you know? Um, so, you know, like as capitalism has become more austere, right? At, over time, it's, it's much harder to just make a go of it, right? I think, I think anybody who lives in a city can tell you this, right? Like, is is your life harder than it was ten years ago? Is your is your rent significantly higher than it was ten years ago? Those of you who live in cities, yeah, right. I mean, rents are dramatically higher, right? A cost of living is dramatically higher. It's harder to just 
get by and this leaves less time for all kinds of things and as you know socialism communism is less of a threat then capitalism doesn't feel like it needs to give as much to labor right i mean you know and the the anti-union march just it continues and escalates right like and <laughs> we get a much more <clears throat> we get a much <clears throat> more brutal <clears throat> version of the system than than what we saw even in the 1950s that makes me think of uh what is it the 996 um working what is it is this some gang shit no <laughs> it, it's happening in in asia i believe it's china where you work nine hours a day uh six days a week something like this right how does a person even have a marriage when you're working like that a good yeah. one Right. A good one. A good one. Yeah, that, that's that's yeah. the million dollar question. I mean, how relationships just to me look differently in this day and age, especially to Dr. Bear's point about people living in major metropolitan areas. It's almost um, a necessity for certain people to be like, oh, hey, we had two good dates. Let's cohabitate because I can't afford this rent and mm -hmm. I don't want to live in my mom's basement forever. So and I can't afford these dates. So I can't afford <laughs> taking you out, paying for drinks. You That's are right. a thirsty one. You are thirsty. I think there's a piece in here too about how we live and how how the nuclear family and the single family house and all this stuff creates a life of isolation, right? I mean, like even if you can afford, you know, that suburban house, it's a very isolating existence, um, you know, and. Um, you know, there's, I think there's a, there's a piece of that too, like that, that loneliness is like this kind of epidemic thing. You know? Oh, Absolutely. I definitely agree with that. I definitely agree with that. And, uh, MT, do you want to speak to that as well? Living in, uh, the big city? Living in the big city. Well, I don't know. I like, I rather like being alone. And so that works for me, but I can tell you, um, for my comrades in the chat sometimes we do get attacked by spam bots and a lot of times these are sex bots mm -hmm. and they'll say things like wanna wanna have a good time click on this link or something like that and so what i started doing was saying wanna have a good time hit like and subscribe <laughs> <laughs> and uh people were sort of making fun of me like oh she's a, she's a spam bot um she's a, she's a sex bot but people were saying that they kind of there was something about it that they kind of liked like it, I, they wish there was a link they could click on to talk to sexy socialists there doesn't seem to be that link <laughs> i mean you could I, <laughs> How do we I, get I mean, there? <laughs> but that that seems like that's just more commodification of the lonely right like you know these dating sites you know well, farmers sure. lonely, christian singles um For being sure. able to nail a profile down to a height age um requirement um but there's that's nowhere that's to, there's nowhere to go i don't think it's a it's um looking for a market solution I, I well that's the that's not the way i see it i see it as um a need uh that's just not being addressed not just by the market but in any other ways as well do you have a link to click on for sexy sexual? <laughs> how do we how do we solve this? Dr. Bear is like he was about to drop his new app. Well, I've been working <laughs> on an app while I've been gone. The date me app. <laughs> Comrade love. Right. So there's I don't know if the app is the is the solution. I I you know it's funny, but like because we're talking about these structural things about how we live, right? And like, mm -hmm. you know, the internet offers us all these different ways of connecting, but it doesn't really change the structures that we're talking about, right? Like it doesn't really mm -hmm. change our view of relationships. It doesn't change the economic structures that hem us in, right? It, it doesn't change how we, where we live, how we live, right? Like that kind of stuff. And um, I mean, it's it's better to have online friends and no friends at all, of course, right? Like, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not, I'm not putting down the internet here. I'm just saying, you know, it, it's limited in terms of like 
you know, it's it, it allows us to function better within these structures that are just hard to live in, right? That's what I'm saying. Right. Pascal, I know, I know you, you think they're that. creating an illusion of connectivity? Well, um, you know, I, I was supposed to come on here and talk about spirituality. So I, I will say from a spiritual <laughs> perspective, life mm -hmm. is an illusion, right? I mean, like, all of this is an illusion. You know, what's the what's the underlying reality? You know, what is real? You know, I mean, I think we're asking that question in a different way now, right? Because, you know, we, um, our sense of reality has been stretched and fractured in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, by the media kind of landscape, right? And how, and what do we what do we take in about the world, right? It's it's not just the things we see around us in an immediate sense, right? It's it's the information that's mediated uh, right through all of these different channels, you know. And I think that that creates even more of a hall of mirrors effect, you know. I mean, like I mean, this is how spiritual people have been talking about it for a long time, right? Like, life is an illusion, you know, like. Right? That's the um, that's one of the things we deal with, right? So, what is real then? You know, what is what is real to people? You know, I mean, like I think that is a question um, that we start with when we approach spirituality. You know, what is real to you? What do you feel? You know, what? Who are you? Right? And how do you how do you explore that? How do you really know yourself? Because it's hard to know others without knowing yourself. Right? How do we talk about spirituality, what you're talking about right now, what we're pivoting the conversation towards, um, yeah. and not fall into the traps of, quote-unquote, mindfulness, you know, the mindfulness industry, the you-have-to-be-happy-all-the-time industry, um, right. joy is the only way. Toxic positivity. Uh, that's what I'm looking for. Thank you. Mm -hmm. MT. Sure. Because this is another fake thing, right? I mean, like the reality mm -hmm. is that we're not, we don't feel positive all the time. We don't feel happy all the time. We don't feel joy all the time. That's not real, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, like to say that you should only have positive thoughts, that's just another way of being fake, right? I mean, like, and we have a lot of messages, we have a lot of structures in society already that tell us to be fake in various ways, right? Um, and and I feel like there's something insidious about, you know, that spirituality has become another industry and it's another thing that that is being sold to us, right? Um, and since you mentioned make mindfulness, right, there's that thread about, um, you know, does learning spiritual disciplines like meditation or breathing practices or whatever, does this make you more productive or whatever? I mean, mm. I think, you know, all the great mystics of the past would be horrified by the idea that the point of this is to make you better at, you know, worldly labor or something like that, right? Like, I mean, you know, <laughs> that's, that's not the point of this, right? I mean, mm. You know, it, it's true that uh, there's a lot of exercises, spiritual, a lot of spiritual exercises, which are about concentrating your mind, right? And concentrating your mind is a general skill that's good for all kinds of things. But that's not all it is, right? I mean, that's not, right? That's a tool. That's not, that's not the end of the journey. That's the beginning. I mean, you know? isn't it, is, do you feel, Pascal and Toussaint, that it is a, a weird uh, tightrope that we walk when we talk about, you know, true self-help, true bettering yourself? Uh, feeling better about yourself, depression. We we constantly talk about atomization and alienization. Um, you know, we're not going to achieve communism, socialism tomorrow. So how do we help ourselves today, I guess is the question, but not fall we, victim to the Listen toxic. to Dr. Bear. <laughs> Who has got answers. a meditation a channel. And a beard. Yeah. And so he knows yeah, always trust the meditation beard and I can, and not afraid to wear flip flops in the winter. <laughs> Is that right? Those, those things right there mean that uh, you can trust this person and he's wearing hemp pants as we speak. Transcending the weather. Okay. I'll take it. Yeah. Just hemp, hemp pants, flip flops in the winter, you know, 
whatever he says on the spiritual tip is going to be correct. <laughs> I think one of the most difficult things to do is actually build actual community, real community. Like I think that's something that is has been lost in in the way the structure of our societies are. When I think to, for example, I've had this conversation with a lot of my friends who are my peers, and we talk about how when our parents were in their 30s or 40s, they had extensive social networks of friends. They, you know, they would they would hang out. So even on the weekends, people would come over to play cards or dominoes or listen to music. And they always had a kind of very lively social interaction amongst their peers. And I talked to my most of my friends who are married, who even have kids, and they live completely isolated lives. They don't see most of their friends ever. They're really just mm -hmm. you know, always chasing their kids from one function to another, whether it's soccer or ballet or this or that. And it, it the ability to just simply enjoy life seems so alien to them. And I'm wondering what exactly happened between the generation of our parents to today where the, these people, they have more education than their parents. They're making more money per se, but their quality of life is much lower. Mm. Yeah, I know. I feel you on this. I, you know, I notice the same thing. Um, and I'm, I'm like, what does it take to just hang out with a friend these days? Right. I mean, like you got to trade half mm -hmm. a dozen texts, you know, like it's not, it's not something that happens. You have to like make it happen. Right. And it's like, you know, we're all tired. We're all like, you know, there's already <laughs> already too many emails and too many texts and too many everything, right? Like, and and when you when it's like this is another thing that you have to do, um, then sometimes it doesn't happen, right? I mean, um, you know, it's like when I when I was a kid, uh, you know, we went outside and played. You know, we had played outside with right? the kids and neighborhood. You know, I mean, like that's different than you know arranging a play date for your kid and you know like. Yeah. And I'm not saying these aren't things that are so easily to change on an individual level, right? I mean, these are these are structural things. These are ways that the whole culture, our whole societies change, right? So, but it, I think it leads more towards isolation for sure. It, it, it is interesting too, because I think another thing is we get to create these communities online, and it's not to say <laughs> one place is better than the other, but the communities that we can create online is a lot of echo chamber, you know, echoing the same thought. I can get in a group of Maoist, you know, little people that only like polka hip hop. And we can talk about that um, for hours on end, but your neighbors aren't going to be um, that same microcosm of people. Like, uh, do people have the ability to be close and even try to connect with people that they may not be on the exact same page with politically? Um, I think is another thing that is, has changed because we can't have friends that are, you know, we're all the same, especially in the online space. I think it's interesting too, when we talk about community, like, I, I, you know, we've so attenuated the old style community that we forgot that there's some significant downsides to the old style community, right? Like, <laughs> you know, like old style communities can be pretty fucking judgmental, right? They can be, they can be like, you know, they can cast you out, right? I mean, like that. Then that's that's difficult, right? I mean, like as you know, I mean, like read the Scarlet Letter sometime, right? I mean, that's <laughs> old. <laughs> True. It, it, it has its problems, you know. I mean, like we we need and and especially as you know, if there isn't like a hegemonic religion. I mean, and if there is, that creates other problems, right? Like, you know, like how do we how do we have like meaningful diversity, uh, and and yet you know have this community, but that that doesn't like oppress you, right? I mean, like that's I don't I don't think we've you know figured that out exactly as a as a human species. I don't know. I I, I dig my community here in uh, in Mexico. I've, I've been able to have a pretty interesting uh, community of people. But I spent a lot. Mayor. Of, I feel like it's, dude, I am, dude. You're you just jealous. Mayor. 
You're jealous. He just walks down the street and says hello to people. And he's super, he's super <laughs> rude to whoever he's on the phone with. Just saying <laughs> hi to everyone else. Stray dogs, you name it. Horses. It's right. One of the top horses and stuff like this, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I spent so many years being in places where they're, it's mildly uncomfortable, man. And sometimes it's extremely uncomfortable, some of the places I was in. Um, yeah. But the the unifying thing was music, kinda. But uh, I I dig community. I definitely dig people. I dig all different kinds of people, and I think we can learn a lot from each other if we listen. If we bother listening. Hmm. Listening. That's important. How novel. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Well, I I have a question. Um. I wonder what avenues uh, extended family can hold for our alienation. I came across this idea of cousin culture. This is on Black Twitter. Cousin culture is not a thing. I'll tell you that right now. But also, can you explain? Because I, I it took a long time for me to realize I couldn't go to blacktwitter.com. <laughs> Stop it. So, but so anyway, <laughs> uh, they were discussing cousin culture, which is supposed to be this idea that black people have where we'll say, we'll call people our cousin when they're not, as if like creating <laughs> creating more extended family. And the idea was that for some reason it seems like white people don't do this. And and the idea was perhaps white people and white families were the most impacted by some of the negative social effects of capitalism. And so maybe they're just more isolated and, and they don't have this aspect of their culture. So, so do you have a play under, under communism, can white people have cousins? First of all, I like to know how do we know that white people don't do this? Maybe this is a southern thing. And maybe they, uh, I told Jason, and Jason was like, "This is the dumbest thing I've ever heard." <laughs> but, <laughs> and it is. Um, but I do, I do wonder about different different avenues for uh, getting through alienation and the white whether family. Or not. I, the white family I lived with right now, Tucson, would be so offended. Yeah, you would, get, you would get the most. I want to speak to the manager talking to. I won't say the woman's <laughs> name right now on air because I I love the family to, to death, but they would definitely be upset with you. Hey man, for saying that. Do white people have play cousins? Can they make them up on the spot and extend their families? I don't know, man. What what really? What what? What, 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 I don't know how to explain There's it. There's a whole history of agrarian American his, society. In Absolutely. Which and we've lost family. that. But can and white people have play cousins is what she's saying. Can, can we all extend our families more? Does, does, does Dr. Bear have a, friend, a really close friend? His kids call him Uncle Johnny. Yeah. The Uncle Johnny. Or I mean, and that's Johnny a way to move dad. away from alienation as well. Yeah, um, I feel like <laughs> a I lot was said. A lot was said. Of, that comes out of like you know, is there like a a tradition of people living in these big extended families, right? And I feel like yeah, mm -hmm. that's less common among white people. I mean, like since we're trading in stereotypes right now, I think that <laughs> totally. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> That's less common, it's, at least in our stereotypes. I mean, I don't know, you know. Um, so, does that does that mean you're less close with your extended family? Yeah, right. I mean, like you're closer with people that you see a lot, you know. But then again, I mean, you know, look the other the the dark side of all this is that we're dealing with, you know, one of the aspects of the patriarchy is a monumental amount of of like sexual abuse, right? I mean, like, and a lot of families have abuse in them, you know, and, and mm -hmm. that that fractures the family, right? So I think it's not that easy to just be like, yeah, okay, now we're gonna like 
you know, <laughs> have these happy extended families when when there's a lot of like, you know, sexual violence um, or other kinds of abuse, you know, in in families, right? That's been overlooked for too long, you know, and now it's getting, you know, blown wide open, right? Which is good, right? That, that shouldn't be right. that shouldn't be kept a secret. But I think it it's part of like isolation thing is part of that, you know. Um, or no. Oof, I mean, you went there with the whole abuse thing. I wasn't expecting that one. That's a, it's, you make a really good point. I mean, I come from um, a background of environmentalism and families are encouraged and extended families and, and any kind of communal, anything, co-ops, all of this sort of thing. Because when you're dealing under capitalism and you've got all this individualism, everybody has their own something. Everybody, every one of your children has their own room, their own lamp, their own comforters. Nobody shares anything. And um, then we have all of this consumption. But you're right, it is a double-edged sword. There are, um, there's levels to it. Yeah, and I'm not saying the answer to that is isolation and alienation, mm -hmm. not at all. I'm just saying, I think it's partly a response, right? Like mm -hmm. that, that you go off and, and be on your own when family hasn't been, let's say, completely positive in your life, right? Um, you know, I'm, I know a lot of people who are like, I don't want to start a family because like, I don't want, you know, like I'm afraid of reproducing the kind of thing that happened to me, you know? Right. Um, so. For sure. You don't, you don't have any kids, Dr. Bear? I do, I have two kids. Okay. Oh well. Do they have beards? <laughs> no, they're, they're 12 and 15. So. Okay. They're working on it. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> Pascal? Yeah. So, I mean, the, one of the questions that I really have is that how do we change the, the social mechanisms we have in our society to really educate people to alternatives? How do we create the the new vision of society that we want as marxist leftist dialectical materialist whatever term you want to use socialist communist people who are anti-capitalist anti-racist uh you know anti-sexist or to the left of the status quo i've been really frustrated as of late in terms of understanding how between media the culture industry entertainment uh 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 the breads and circ bread and circuses the people really are stuck to the reactionary narrative of capitalist realism what are the tools that can be harnessed to puncture that in a body politic that clearly is being denied the the, abil the ability to challenge the core elements of what the problem is. Yeah. Well, that's the question, right? How do we, <laughs> where do, what is to be done? Where do we go from here? How do we, mm -hmm. I mean, there are so many areas that require organization, right? Like, um, I mean, just on a, since we're talking about where and how do we live, right? I mean, I like, I think, one of the most immediate ways to organize is just around things like tenants' rights, just around things like stopping an eviction, right? Like mm -hmm. somebody gets evicted, I mean, their life gets immediately worse, right? Their, the, ch the chance that somebody becomes homeless, right, is much, much higher. I mean, you know, and, and given that we're under assault by these incredible rising rents, I mean, we have to we we have to work on we have to struggle on that level right like i don't think i don't think we can just limit our struggles to you know the workplace or or to politics or you know i mean we have to struggle in all these all these places and and i think along the way we need to think about you know what are the options that that we're given you know um i go I, I, okay i'm gonna i'll share a little story i i grew up in you know a spiritual like hippie subculture right so, um, and I grew up in like a, a commune, like a hippie Sufi commune. Um, and uh, we lived in this 
big old house from the 1800s. And this is in, in Boston. At the time, it was a pretty rough neighborhood. It's now become totally gentrified. So these houses are all like $2 million homes. But at the time I was growing up, it was the kind of neighborhood where somebody would light a car on fire every New Year's Eve, uh, that kind of neighborhood, right? So, <laughs> and <laughs> we, all, we all lived together. And, you know, it was like, yeah, um, it, it's a funny thing because you have this group of people living in a rich person's house you know, like, but from that's old, right? And run down. And it, it's just interesting how the physical space imposes a certain structure on it, right? Like it's hard to live in a collective or whatever, live in a commune when the whole house itself is geared towards, you know, it's the master bedroom or whatever, right? Like, mm -hmm. is it funny how it's in our language, you know? Um, so I, I think we, we, part of it is like, we we need to um you know we need to have the courage to be imaginative you know we need to like figure this out together like i mean i'm not i'm not gonna tell everyone like oh here's the right way to live or whatever i think that's crazy right i mean like i, I feel like marxism is like we have faith in the masses of people to work this out right like collectively together you know um and I think that's that's really where we have a difference with the reactionaries, right? The reactionaries are always telling us, you know, this is how everyone should live, right? Or this, you know, and and I don't I don't think Marxism has a parallel to that, you know. Indeed. Um, yes, Tucson, you want to ask this uh, final question before we go? Sure. Well, I have my uh, my concerns about the alienation that some of us are experiencing. And I wonder about our relationships to ourselves. Um, and I wonder if you could lead us in a sort of a brief meditation on that, just to, you know, it's Valentine's Day and there's, there's a heavy focus on romantic love, but we have our relationships to ourselves as Absolutely. well. And sure. those relationships hopefully would be loving. And so, if you could lead us in a brief meditation on that, that would be awesome. Let's do it. All right. Well, we start with meditation. We start by just uh, adopting a, um, a good upright posture. So try to sit in, in such a manner so that you your uh, your spine is upright. Right. We're going to be being still in meditation. Uh, it's easy to get sleepy. So if you if you're sitting up straight, then you. Um, are less likely to, to have that, right? We want to be still, but energized. So you close your eyes and you tune into your breath. So your breath is your fundamental connection to life. Breath is life. And you learn from paying attention to your breath, you learn where you are energetically, spiritually. And since most of us are breathing very high in the chest, we want to breathe in such a way so that our belly is expanding as we breathe in and contracting as we breathe out. So diaphragmatic breathing, belly breathing. As you breathe in and out of your belly, you start to slow down your breath and slow down your rhythm. And you begin to have space to feel where you are. What are you thinking? What are you feeling? Now, the thing that often stops people about meditation is that not all of those thoughts and feelings feel that good. They're not always positive. It's not always unicorns and rainbows and chocolate and rip whipped cream or whatever. There are difficult, challenging thoughts and feelings that come up. 
And so you just breathe into them. Allow them to move, to transform, to flow. Use your breath. And as you breathe, you are energizing yourself. You're energizing your spirit. And as you do this over time, you find that you become more and more clear. You know, yourself is like a pond. When the pond gets stirred up, it's kind of muddy. The water isn't clear. As you breathe in stillness, all of that settles down. And the truth of your being emerges. And that tells you so much about yourself, about how you spend your time, about your longing, about where you're going. <coughs> So my hope for all of you is that on this, uh, this Valentine's Day period that you are able to open and cover these aspects of yourself and know who you are in order to know others and to improve this world. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Baird. Any, any uh, final comments, Pascal Robert? Not at all. <laughs> you have no more questions. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any, any, uh, anything you'd like to add? I think that was a wonderful note to end things on. This must be what you do when you're on Twitter. You're just... <laughs> <laughs> you know? That's not true. That is not true. No? <laughs> that is not true. Well, I mean, Twitter is a space where you dialogue, so I dialogue. But, you know, I like to think that I don't let things, um, you know, really get to me. Right? Yeah. <laughs> if you would have been on our pre-show call today, <laughs> Mary, we started out about Twitter and then... I couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> it took me to finish writing like the intro to the show for me to stop finally laughing. I laughed for a good 15 minutes. Well, this wasn't about something that I said on Twitter, was it? I mean, this is not this time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But it, uh, Everything that was said was some of the funniest things I've ever heard from the group of people that are part of this show. And it was kind of the core of us that are never on a phone call at once anymore. And <sighs> Pascal, I'm still laughing at you, by the way. <laughs> Truly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Too well, sorry. I love to see where the show has gone, and you know, you, you guys are, are doing an incredible job. And you know, I remember when I first came on this show. What was this like three years ago or something three years like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, that was a very different show. You know, and now, it's like you, you all have really, <laughs> you know, really come a long way. So it's fantastic. We're about we, to hit our five hundred show. I don't count some of those shows because those are like before. Stop it. So I only count the shows that are, and then it's all the other shows we do. We do so much other shows, so many other shows with uh, TIR present shows. We do like another hundred shows with those. Wow. Wow. Mau Mau, Gaming Materialists, Pop Life, Red Zone. Now nailing it down. We had Masha and the Bears for a while. We did so many other shows that we put out the review shows of the video essays 
mm-hmm. an extra hundred shows. That's a lot of shows. <laughs> That's a lot of shows. <laughs> <laughs> but it's great. That's how you build something, you know. I mean, That's right. Yeah, I I want to I want to thank the chat for taking some time away from Joe Brandon and the State <laughs> of the Union and all the stress about that. The chat um, stopped while we were meditating. Yeah, I I appreciate you guys taking taking it right. seriously and and maybe trying this on your own too. That's very. There's cool. nothing wrong with meditation. Don't let people tell you it's some rad lib bullshit. There's nothing wrong with trying to center yourself. You guys always have a very active uh, chat space, and you know lots of lots of interesting stuff being said. So mm-hmm. that's it's cool how involved the audience is. You know? We, Love we chat. appreciate the chat, and it's even cooler to meet people in real life. So. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you, Dr. Bear. I'm all calm now. Thank you, Dr. Bear, for uh, <laughs> Terry Gross all of a sudden from NPR. Thank you, Dr. Bear, for joining us with your. Thanks so much for having me. It's always, it's always a pleasure. On behalf of Pascal Robert and MT Toussaint, I am Jason Miles, and uh, <laughs> we are. We'll see you in the champagne room where we'll be talking more shit. Talk to you're 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 tough now. You're not joining us in the champagne, correct? Um, maybe I'll come in for a little bit. Okay, well we'll send you that link as well, so you can come in and talk more shit with us. Thank you guys, <laughs> and have a very good night. And we are out. Out.